Now that the timing is done, I can uh, continue assembling the rest of the engine. Here I started installing the CAM followers and um, I was using, again, a lot of oil everywhere. But as Chef Tash commented in my previous or one of my previous videos, uh, it's much better to use uh, assembly loop. It's much uh, thicker and it sticks to the parts and stays there for a long time. Where the oil, the regular oil, kind of um, drains down to the sump again and then the parts remain uh, a little bit dry and when you start the engine for the first time if especially if it sits a couple of days after you rebuild it without starting it when you start it for the first time uh, there is a high risk of uh, starting it dry actually because also the oil filter needs to be filled up and everything but uh, in this specific case if you remember, the engine wasn't showing any oil pressure on the gauge when I was uh, running it before I took it apart. I believe that that was the issue with uh, the gauge or something else because I checked the oil pump and so and there was nothing wrong with it. But still, I'm I want to make sure that it's uh, running well before I start the engine. So I'm planning to prime it. Uh, I'm gonna drop a shaft um, into the opening for the distributor and I'm gonna drive the oil pump with my drill to make sure that there's gonna be oil pressure on the gauge and to make sure that the oil fills up the filter and goes all over the engine before I attempt starting it for the first time. So that's why it doesn't really matter here that I'm using a normal engine oil. But let's focus on uh, what is this guy doing here because he assembled the whole engine while well, we were talking about the oil and the uh, assembly loop here. So as we said, first I installed the calm followers, then I smeared some uh, permatex from a gasket on the head gasket, installed the head gasket, dropped the head on top and now I'm uh, tightening the bolts or actually the nuts here, the retaining nuts. I checked the torque in the manual, it needs to be 80 foot-pounds here, but I went uh, in three rounds. First I went with uh, 50, then I went with 65, and the last third round I went with 80. And I was following the pattern which is shown in the manual. You start from the center and then go in like circles around until you reach the two ends of the block. Uh, this is to avoid warping on the head. Next I started installing the push rods. I was keeping them all that time in, uh, in this piece of cardboard, numbered, so they can go back in the same places where they came out from. Because each trio, a cam follower, push rod and a rocker, grew up together and they know each other so I don't need to reintroduce them, you know. Next I installed the rocker shaft and because I was I cleaned it uh, very well with uh, brake cleaner uh, now it's totally dry so I used a lot of oil here too made sure that I slide the rockers left and right also uh, so the oil goes under them as well just make sure that everything is nice and oily <coughs> And then when I was tightening the nuts, I tried to keep the shaft uh, straight and uh, tighten a little bit one nut, then the other, then the next one, etc. And then go back to the first one and uh, just to make sure that the shaft doesn't get under pressure and doesn't get bent. And I also made sure that all the rockers fall right on top of the push rods. Then I adjusted the valves, I don't think I need to explain too much here, that's a pretty straightforward process. For this engine the gap needs to be 10,000 of an inch, 
uh, for the exhaust and for the intake. Uh, that's considering you have the original camshaft in the car. If you have some performance camshaft, then you need to follow the spec that comes with it. I don't know if this is the case uh, every time you rebuild an engine, because I haven't rebuilt so many yet, but it happened to me with my Spitfire when I changed the head gasket, it happened with the TR4 engine and now it happens with this one too. After I start the engine and it runs for a while, the valves need to be readjusted, they become very noisy, the engine starts smoking and things like that, so they have to be readjusted one more time. Again, I don't know if that's normal or it happens only to me, but that's what's, what's happening. And now I'm gonna install the distributor. That's also another part that's very interesting, at least for me. I'm sorry about the background noises, but uh, I'm in a working environment after all. <laughs> so I need to be at the top dead center of the first cylinder on the firing stroke. Now here I'm at the top dead center. Like I don't have the pointer anymore, but I can see the marks at the back. The mark on the crankshaft and the mark on the plate. They match, so I'm at the top dead center right now of the first cylinder, but I don't have any gap here, which means that both my valves are a little bit open. So this is my exhaust. So I have to make one more turn on the crank so I can get to the to the firing stroke. I am at the top dead center of the first cylinder again. And now I have a gap on both valves. So this is when I'm firing on the first cylinder. So with the crankshaft in this position and obviously the um, camshaft in this position, we have to lower the drive shaft for the um, distributor in this position. You see how this slot is a little bit off center. So it needs to be from the center up and it needs to end up in this position, diagonally. So for this reason, it needs to go a little bit like that, so when it goes down and the teeth slide, it's gonna spin and it's gonna end up in this position. So I'm gonna lower it like this. And it's in the right position. Now though we have to make sure that it also engages with the shaft on the uh, oil pump. So that's why I'm gonna have to turn the engine again until it goes down, until the, the drive shaft goes down. Oh, so now it engaged with the oil pump shaft. So now again I have to turn the engine until I have the crankshaft in position where the, dry, the first cylinder is in the top dead center with in the firing stroke. Okay, but I think we are one tooth out. Yeah, we are one tooth <coughs> too much, so we have to return. We have to do it one more time. I'm gonna bring it up. Okay, and now I have to repeat the same procedure because again it's not <coughs> engaged to the oil pump shaft. Just keep pushing it down. Okay, now it is engaged with the cam with the oil pump shaft. And I'm gonna turn
Yeah, that's the correct position. So I'm gonna move the camera so you can see. That's the correct position for the drive shaft. Okay, that's the procedure, but now I'm gonna have to take the drive shaft again out because I want to measure the end fold. To measure the end fold, I'm gonna use this washer, which is uh, which is sixty three thousandths of an inch. So I'm gonna put it on the shaft and I'm gonna lower it again. Did you just check your phone? <laughs> it was mine. And now I know that the shaft is 63 thousandths of an inch higher than what it is supposed to be. Now I'm gonna put the distributor without gasket. And now I'm gonna have to measure this gap to see how big of a gap do we have there? So I'm just gonna grab a random combination of leaves. Wow! And it's almost the perfect combination. <laughs> mm, just a little bit thicker. Oh, that's too thick. Oh, no, actually, that's perfect. Perfect, so this is the gap. Let's see how to do that. So that's 65. So we have a washer of 63 thousandths of an inch inside, and we have a gap of 65. So if we remove the washer, we will go down by 63 thousandths of an inch, but because we have 65 gap, we will still, we will still have 2 thousandths of an inch gap which means that we need two thousandths of an inch to cover this gap then we're gonna be at zero and then we need five more to have five thousandths of an inch end float so we need two plus five seven thousandths of an inch gasket and we have here three gaskets so let's see all right seven so this is the perfect gasket. Let me see the other one. Oh, they're all seven? Yeah, they're all seven. So we only need one gasket. So now I can remove the washer and install the gasket. Isn't that nice? Gasket maker, gasket, distributor, everything. And hey, wasn't I gonna prime the engine just before I started? Right, I remembered about that a couple of days later. Anyway, so I installed the gasket here, but a couple of days later I had to take it out again and install new gaskets after I primed the engine. Now take a note here at the position of the distributor rotor. That's the correct position when the crankshaft is in the top dead center of the firing stroke of the first cylinder. Do you remember that slot on the top of the drive shaft that was a little bit off center? That slot makes it impossible to put the rotor in different position. It, it can go only one position. And if this position is not this position here, then something is wrong with the drive shaft. And later I'm gonna show you how I did the ignition timing.
I didn't forget that the oil sump was held only by two screws, so I turned the engine upside down, smeared some uh, gasket maker on the surface, installed the gasket, put the sump, and with the help of Jake, I closed the engine. Uh, this is my proof that uh, Jake was part of uh, the rebuilding of this engine, and if anything goes wrong, it's his fault, it's not mine, okay? The rest of the engine assembly is pretty straightforward, so it doesn't need too much explanation, except of here, this uh, oil deflector is another brand new aftermarket part that doesn't fit. So I have to file it a little bit until it fits on the crankshaft. Yeah, but everything else was uh, pretty easy and nice, and I don't think that I need to explain too much about it. And I paid attention for the position of the chain tensioner. And finally the moment came when I was gonna put the engine on the chassis. And if you notice here, the, f the chassis was uh, fully refurbished too. Uh, that happened since I was rebuilding the engine. John, as known as the owner, uh, cleaned it up. Stephanie, who just passed by, uh, she derusted and painted it. And I uh, disassembled all the suspension, changed all the bushings and uh, all the parts that needed to be changed and assembled it again. But for that I'm gonna make a separate video. So now we are really building it from the ground up. The rear end of the engine I held with a jack underneath because the transmission was not on yet. And here another mistake. I should have installed the crank pulley before I dropped the engine because now the steering rack is on my way. So good thing I got that on time because I had to lift the engine at least one side again and install the pulley. This, by the way, is not fast forward. This is the usual pace of my colleagues. This is how they work. Then I moved to the back of the engine and I started installing the flywheel. I didn't forget to install the bushing that goes on the flywheel. I believe it goes on the flywheel on the early models and on the later models it goes on the crankshaft. And then I installed the flywheel. There is a locating pin, so you can put it only in one position. I torque the bolt to 95 foot-pounds. And last but not least, I installed the clutch. I use the locating uh, tool to position the disc in the right position and install the plate. Then the transmission came on. The starter. The clutch slave cylinder, which I found out later somebody installed on the wrong side of the plate. But that's another story, I'm gonna show it in another video. I connected the drive shaft, but because uh, I'm missing one uh, mounting plate here for the uh, rear end of the gearbox, it's on a back order, it's gonna come soon, so I just put that piece of wood there to hold the transmission in place. Then I installed the exhaust and the intake manifolds.
and finally the carbs. Well, I'm gonna cut this video here, but just to make sure that you're gonna be back for the next one, I'm gonna show you this without saying anything, and I'll show you what it is and what is it doing there in the next episode.